on the show. I am Joe Topat. The new Ghostbusters movie has proven divisive among fans of the franchise. Instead of doing a video on how good or how bad the new movie is, I decided to focus more on something fans can agree on. That the real Ghostbusters is awesome. Most cartoons based on movies last a couple of seasons and make at most 26 episodes. Then they're just tossed aside and forgotten about except for real hardcore fans. Whereas the real Ghostbusters lasted 7 seasons, made a total of 140 episodes, and is talked about to this very day. People love it as much as the movie. Why is that? Well, I think it's because it's an awesome show. It understood what the movie is, a comedy based in horror. And the writers of this show took full advantage of that, because the episodes range anywhere from goofy to scary. And it all fits in because that's what Ghostbusters is, goofy and scary. So in celebration of the real Ghostbusters 30th anniversary, I decided to do a three-part video in which I count down the top 15 best episodes of the real Ghostbusters. Why top 15 and not top 10? Or top 11 in the case of Nostalgia Critic? Well, when re-watching this show, I found that it had too many good episodes to just narrow down to 10 or even 11. It needed to be 15, and even then that proved difficult to narrow down, which speaks volumes to the writing of this wonderful show in which it needed to be 15, and I wish it could be 20, but, well, I didn't want to push it too far. So let's get out the DVDs and the bag of marshmallows as I count down the top 15 best episodes of the real Ghostbusters. Number 15. Chicken He Clucked. <laughs> I'm sorry, folks. I can't keep a straight face because... This episode is about a man named Cubby who lives above a chicken restaurant and he is driven to insanity because he has to smell chicken every day of his life. <laughs> I mean, look at the guy. He even looks like a chicken. <laughs> anyway. He goes to his local library where he checks out a book on how to conjure up a demon. Hmm. Libraries have books like that? Wonder what section that would be under. When he conjures him up, the demon expects him to request money or power, but instead he wants to... Yeah. Yeah. He wants to do away with all the chickens. The demon tries his best to get Cubby to take money or power, but he wants none of that. So as a consolation, the demon grants him the ability to make things disappear and reappear. Once his fellow demons found out what he did, he becomes the laughing stock of the underworld. So the demon has to call the Ghostbusters in order to make things right. A demon call on the Ghostbusters? <laughs> wow. That's sad. It is a stupid episode, it's ridiculous, and the story makes no sense, but it is so funny in its execution that it deserves to be at number 15. Number 14, Venkman's Ghost Repellers. Although Peter Venkman has always acted more like a street hustler than a scientist, his father is much, much worse. While Peter makes an honest living as a Ghostbuster, his father makes his living as a con man. He's not really a bad guy, it's just to quote his son, he can't make an honest buck. His latest con is to sell ponchos as ghost repellers, and even tries to get the Ghostbusters to endorse his product. But they want none of it, and Peter even tells them straight up to go straight, and his father promises he would. Only, he does not follow through with that. Mr. Venkman then sells his ponchos to a scientist who is going to explore the New Jersey parallelogram. Think Bermuda Triangle, only set in New Jersey. 
The punctures fail to work and the scientists and his crew get stuck in the parallelogram. The Ghostbusters are then called in and they have to take the case because, well, Peter's father was the cause of all it. To Mr. Venkman's credit, he does feel bad about what happened and tries to help out. He then gets trapped in the parallelogram, and the Ghostbusters have to come save him. What makes this episode work is Peter's relationship with his father. Although the two have a strained one, they do care about each other. The real Ghostbusters would feature other relatives of the Ghostbusters, such as Egon's uncle, Ray's aunt and Winston's father, but Peter's dad would make the most appearances at three. Twice he was voiced by Lorenzo Music, and once he was voiced by Dave Coulier. Number 13. Big Trouble for Little Slimer. He's back. The greatest enemy the Ghostbusters has ever encountered. No, I'm not talking about Gozer, or Vigo, or even Ivo Shandor. I am talking about Peckless. Okay, his name is Walter Peck. Peck had been fired from his job at the EPA, and now has a new position within the government. Like in the movie, he uses his new position to try to take out the Ghostbusters, with no success. Only this time he isn't alone. He has an assistant named Callahan. Unlike Peck, Callahan does not seem interested in hurting the Ghostbusters, nor does he seem to have any hatred for them. He just does what Peck tells him to do. And, to be honest, he seems bored half the time. I guess I would be too if I have to listen to Peck's ramblings on how much he hates the Ghostbusters and how they ruined him. Does Callahan even know how to smile? He looks like he wants to kill himself. When his attempts to discredit the Ghostbusters failed, Peck decides to make them suffer. He does so by getting a warrant to take Slimer away from them. He then has Slimer sent to a laboratory where a series of tests are done. Even though Slimer was deemed harmless, Peck decides to have him destroyed. Yeah, he went there. This is a bigger dick move than in the movie, because in the movie, he just wants the containment units shut down. Here, he wants Slimer murdered. Yeah, he's technically already dead being a ghost, but still he wants him destroyed just to make the Ghostbusters suffer. It just shows how deep his hatred for them runs. I have a small confession to make. I had seen this episode before I saw the first movie, so I did not know who Wolf the Peck was or why he hates the Ghostbusters. In a way, that's the problem with this episode. It assumes you have seen the first movie. Because they make no reference to Peck before or after this episode. But regardless, it's a great episode. I just wished he was in more. I wish Jack Hardemeyer was in one. Number 12. The Copycat. A woman who lives in the rich neighborhood summons the Ghostbusters to get rid of a ghost that's been trashing her house. Although they saw the mess, the PKE meter does not detect any ghosts. Ghostbusters assume there are no ghosts around, and they just pack up and go home. Only they didn't see something hitch a ride on Ecto-1 in the form of their logo. Upon coming back to the firehouse, the Ghostbusters are informed that they can relax since there were no more calls. Winston works on that, though. Ray and Egon work on the transdimensional portal, and Peter and Slimer do the laundry. But during this time, weird stuff start to happen. Slimer's cheeseburger just gets up and walks away. Peter comes in and dumps oil all over Winston's coveralls. Janine sees herself in the hallway, and Egon cuts the power to the transdimensional portal. It turns out a ghost called a metamorph, or a copycat, has infiltrated the Ghostbusters headquarters. Luckily, Egon installed a security system to keep the ghost in. But the problem is how to find it. 
One of the things that people are most afraid of is not being able to trust anyone or anything. This episode really plays on that fear. For throughout the whole thing, the Ghostbusters don't know what is or isn't the copycat. And that's what makes this episode work so well, because the copycat can be anyone or anything. Well, except for Ray and Winston. The copycat never impersonated them. Number 11. The Devil to Pay. It has been a long time since the Ghostbusters has enjoyed a vacation. In fact, Peter in particular has been having dreams lately about being in Tahiti surrounded by beautiful women. Hey, it's Peter. Uh, unfortunately, it seemed like Peter's dream of going to Tahiti to meet all those women was not meant to be. But then he discovers a game show called Race the Devil. On this game show, the grand prize is a trip to Tahiti. It seems like a dream come true, right? A, a sign from heaven, right? Oh boy, is he ever wrong. Peter convinces Ray and Winston, who love game shows, to appear as contestants on Race to Devil. The show is hosted by a guy named Dib Devlin. Egon notices that every question Devlin asks, Ray and Winston, revolve around the devil. You see, Dib Devlin is a dibbick, and Ray and Winston are playing for their souls. There was a scene in the very first movie where Ray and Winston are discussing their religious views. Ray was agnostic while Winston was a full believer in God. In fact, he says he loves Jesus' style. While the real Ghostbusters never discussed the religious views of any of the characters, the sole exception is in this episode where Winston's views are on full display. In fact, he takes it the hardest when he found out that Dib Devlin was a demon and he had signed the contract with him. In one scene, he says over and over again, I sold my soul to the devil. When Ray informed him that Dib Devlin was a minor demon and not the devil, he said to the annoyance of Ray, I sold my soul to a minor demon. In most episodes, all the Ghostbusters would have to do is get out their proton packs, zap the ghosts, suck them up in the traps, and place them in the containment unit. Here they cannot do that because Dip Devlin is not a ghost. He is a demon from hell. So... Ray and Winston have to actually play Race the Devil in the hopes that they could win their souls. And a trip to Tahiti, because that's what Peter wants. And they'd better get that trip. I admire the writers for coming up with scenarios where the Ghostbusters cannot simply use their proton packs. Because, well, let's face it, it would get kind of boring after a while if all they have to do is zap and trap. Plus, it's actually kind of fun to see them come up with ways to deal with these supernatural demons that don't involve their equipment. One of the many ideas that Dan Aykroyd had for Ghostbusters 3 was to have the Ghostbusters go to hell. Well, we all know how that turned out. This show actually uses that idea way before even the second movie came out. Number 10. The Collect Call of Cthulhu. Hmm. How many kids know who H.P. Lovecraft is? I doubt very many, unless you're a really big bookworm. So... Does that mean we shouldn't mention him in children's cartoons, since they wouldn't be familiar with him? Hell no! One of the best ways to introduce someone to a generation who has never heard of him is to mention them in popular cartoons. Like, in this case, H.P. Lovecraft and the real Ghostbusters. It's a perfect combination. He wrote about horror and weird tales, so why not mention them here? 
Anyway, the story is about the Necronomicon, a spellbook that Lovecraft wrote about, is being placed on display at the New York Public Library. One of the people who works at the library feels uncomfortable with putting the Necronomicon on full display because of the evil spells it contains, and it could be stolen and used for evil. Clark Ashton, his associate, does not believe the Necronomicon is anything but a harmless book. Well, this harmless book becomes harmful when followers of Cthulhu, or Cthulhu as he's pronounced in according to H.P. Lovecraft, but here he's called Cthulhu. Why they called him Cthulhu and not Cthulhu, I don't know, it's just what they called him. Anyway, these followers steal the book, and the Ghostbusters are brought in to try to retrieve it, because the followers of Cthulhu, or Cthulhu, or Little Mary Sunshine, whatever he's called, could be brought about and destroy the entire world. What doesn't bring about the destruction of the world in this series? You know, come to think of it, why would you bring a book that can conjure up a creature as deadly as Cthulhu on display at a library? Why not just lock it up or burn it? That's like asking for trouble to put on display. That's just my two cents. What makes this episode work so well is just how creepy it is. One part in particular that always frightened me as a child was when a guard went to investigate a noise. He was about ready to turn on the lights when a tentacle grabs his hand, preventing him from doing so. He turns around and shines his flashlight into this, the spawn of Cthulhu. He, is he gone? Oh, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> Number 9. Elementary My Dear Winston. The episode Boo Donna establishes the fact that Winston is a huge fan of mysteries. So it was only natural that the Ghostbusters would do an episode where they meet the most famous fictional detective of all time, Sherlock Holmes. The ghost of Professor Moriarty, Sherlock Holmes' longtime rival, is going around sucking out the evil energy of all objects that has evil so he can come back to life. He kidnaps Dr. Watson, or the ghost of Dr. Watson, and holds him hostage. The ghost of Sherlock Holmes enlists the aid of Winston Zedmore, who is a huge fan of Sherlock Holmes, in order to take out the evil ghost of Professor Moriarty. Is elementary my dear Winston saying that Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Watson, and Professor Moriarty were real people? No. This episode fully acknowledges their fictional characters. So, if they're fictional characters, why are they ghosts? According to Egon, because so many people believe Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Watson, and Professor Moriarty were real people, that belief manifested itself into the forms that they are, and what he termed as belief made manifest. Because they are not real ghosts per se, the Ghostbusters proton packs have zero effect on them. The reason why this episode is on the list is because I love Sherlock Holmes. He is awesome. <laughs> I mean, seeing Winston, my favorite Ghostbuster, meet Sherlock Holmes, my favorite detective. That's... It's like peanut butter, meat, and chocolate to form a Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. This is... This episode is a Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. But... The question is, if the Ghostbusters cannot use their proton packs on Moriarty, how do they stop him? Well, the answer lies in their traps. And it leads to, well, let's say, a downer of an ending. Number 8. The Grundle. This episode starts off with the Ghostbusters dealing with the Jabberwocky. After they had trapped them, they go back to Ector 1 and found it stripped down. It turned out a kid named Larry had stripped it down and showed no remorse. And Peter wonders what makes a good kid go bad. Oh, Peter, you will get your answer. 
This episode revolves around two brothers named Lee and Alec. Lee had observed that his brother Alec has been acting very strange lately. At first he just assumes that his brother is just acting up, but then he notices that Alec has been talking to a creature. And he begins to suspect this creature is making Alec do bad things. He informs the Ghostbusters of his suspicions after a little mishap in the auditorium. Winston informs him that they had never heard of anything like that before, but they would look into it and would get back to him if they find anything. Egon does some research and discovers that the creature controlling Alec is a Grundle. What is a Grundle, you may ask? A Grundle is a creature that makes children do bad things, and the more bad things that child does, the more he looks like a Grundle. And the more he looks like a Grundle, the more he becomes a Grundle. And then he would go out and pick another kid and the cycle would just go on. You know, there's a lot of truth in this scenario. I'm not saying that there are real Grundles in the world, but there are bad people who try to make kids like them. The hardest part is to make the kids realize that it's not cool to be like them until it's too late. And I appreciate that the writers are able to get this message out there without coming across as preachy. Number 7 When Halloween Was Forever Halloween and Ghostbusters. Can a kid ask for a better combination? The closer it gets to Halloween, the more the ghosts seem to be more difficult than they really should be. And Egon theorizes that the reason for this has something to do with Irish ruins that date back to when Halloween was first started. Well, he may be close to the truth because two goblins bust in the museum and release the creature known as Samhain. Samhain is the reason why we celebrate Halloween, and he's also in charge of the creatures of the night. He gathers them all together to try to make Halloween last forever. Well, Slimer's not exactly welcome among them, since he lives with the Ghostbusters. What makes when Halloween last forever work is Samhain. Like Gozer, Samhain is a god. All the creatures of the night obey him, even Slimer had to come when he called. Now, one thing I found interesting is the fact they gave him the Irish accent, thus connecting him with the Celtic tales of Samhain, or however you pronounce that in real life. Now, I like the fact they gave him a purple robe and a pumpkin head. For those of you who say that the Irish didn't have pumpkins, it's called artistic license. The real Ghostbusters mostly has the guys deal with a different ghost each week. Sam Hain is one of the few who makes a reappearance. He appears in the episode Halloween Two and a Half and would do a cameo here and there. He appears in the opening to Slimer and the Real Ghostbusters, as well as Extreme Ghostbusters. Though he was never in an episode of Extreme Ghostbusters. Sam Hain would make appearances in comic books and would be featured in action figures. Sam Hain, the most iconic ghost created for this show. Number 6 The Ghostbusters in Paris A lazy worker decides to take a nap in the office of Monsieur Eiffel at the Eiffel Tower. What he finds in the office is some equipment that was made by Monsieur Eiffel himself, but he accidentally breaks it and, eh, no big deal to him. He's like, I'll just replace it. Nothing bad will happen, right? Well, it definitely becomes a problem when ghosts start popping up at the Eiffel Tower, which causes tourists to stay away, leading to the loss of revenue. Maybe you shouldn't have took a nap in the office of Monsieur Eiffel, you lazy dope. The Ghostbusters are brought in to take care of the ghost at the Eiffel Tower. The government then pays for the hotel, which they get the best in all of Paris. 
So for two days, they go everywhere but the Eiffel Tower. When they finally arrive at the Eiffel Tower, they encounter some of the freakiest looking ghosts in the history of the show. I mean, just look at them. There's far too many for them to just use their traps. In this episode, we run two things. One, Winston used to be a construction worker. I bet you didn't know that, especially if you've only seen the movies. And two, Monsieur Eiffel was a Ghostbuster, and he had constructed the Eiffel Tower to be a ghost containment unit. And since the equipment had been destroyed by that lazy worker, seriously, he should be fired for that. All the ghosts were allowed to escape, and in 12 hours, the tower would explode. The Ghostbusters should have been doing their job instead of goofing off for two days. I'm just saying! Now, the idea that the Eiffel Tower is a ghost containment unit may sound silly, but it does work. Given the bloody history of France, it makes sense. I mean, like I've said, those are some freaky ghosts. They don't hesitate to kill. I mean, there was one scene where one of them went in the side of Gargoyle and was about ready to throw Winston off of Notre Dame. That's... Those are some serious ghosts! So the next time you go to the Eiffel Tower and, and see some ancient equipment, do not break it. And if you do, replace it right away, because you might unleash a bunch of ghosts. Number 5. Citizen Ghost Here's a question every viewer of this show has asked. Why do the Ghostbusters allow a ghost to live with them? Reporter Cynthia Crawford asked this question to Peter during an interview about the Ghostbusters. Well, Peter explains that there are practical reasons for keeping them around. It started after they defeated Ghost of the Gozarian. And before they got sued by everybody in New York and causing them to lose their business and have to restart it five years later. Anyway, the Ghostbusters arrive at their headquarters to find it completely destroyed. Their first order of business before rebuilding was to get rid of their old uniforms due to the amount of ectoplasm they absorbed. Janine had given them their new uniforms that had arrived just before they went off to fight Gozer. Well, Peter was put in charge of destroying their old ones. Well, let's just say he didn't do it. In the rush to rebuild the firehouse, the Ghostbusters start to feel like someone or something was watching them. It turned out it was the green ghost from the Cedric Hotel. This puzzles them. If he had escaped like the rest of the ghost, why did he choose to stay? Was it because of the food? Another shot at Peter? Or like what Janine says, maybe he's lonely and that he feels comfortable around them. While they were very dismissive of that idea, I actually think Janine was onto something. The Ghostbusters saw a lot of the Green Ghost over time, and they just largely tolerated him. Brave was the one who got friendly with him and decided to give him the name Slimer just to annoy Peter. As for their old uniforms, well, they absorbed a lot of ghost residue due to a crack in the containment unit, and they just got up and walked away becoming their ghost doppelgangers. Their goal is to become the real Ghostbusters by destroying them. What makes this episode so great is not only does it explain why Slimer lives with them, but it is also hilarious to hear Peter cover up the fact that he's responsible for what happened. And since she's only talking to him, she is not getting the full story. As everyone knows, Slimer will go on to be one of the most popular characters on the show. In fact, it would later be renamed Slimer and the Real Ghostbusters, and he would star in his own series of cartoons. In some ways, it's all connected with this episode of Citizen Ghost. Number 4. 
No one comes to Lupusville. Late one night, a mysterious man named Gregor comes to the firehouse. Janine informs him that the Ghostbusters were asleep, but Gregor says that he couldn't come in the morning because that would be inconvenient. So he sends word for them to come to Lupusville the next night. When they arrive, he informs them that he wants to hire them to do away with some vampires that's been trouble in the town. Well, at first, Winston was against the idea since they had never dealt with vampires before. But since Gregor was willing to pay handsomely, they agree. Their first encounter with the vampires ends in disaster. Peter and Ray are then kidnapped by the vampires. Instead of sucking the blood, the vampires decide to use Ray and Peter. You see, Gregor was not on the up and up with the Ghostbusters. For, get this, Gregor himself is a vampire. Apparently there was a schism within the vampire community and whether or not to be nomadic or to settle down. Gregor and his followers preferred to settle down. Thus, they took over the town of Lupusville and imprisoned the original townspeople. As for the nomadic vampires, they were at constant war with them. Thus, why Gregor called the Ghostbusters in to take care of them. What he didn't know about the original townspeople was they were in fact werewolves. Well, Lupus is Latin for wolf, so it's kind of in the name. No One Comes to Lupusville is like such a great episode because of its dark atmosphere, the war between the vampires and the werewolves, and plus it answers the age-old question of what happens when a werewolf bites a vampire and vice versa. Number 3 The Brooklyn Triangle Like Venkman's Ghost Repellers, the Brooklyn Triangle features the father of one of the Ghostbusters. In this case, Ed Zedmore, Winston's dad. A few construction workers have been doing some digging when they find something mysterious underground. They have no idea what it is, so they want to call the Ghostbusters. Well, their boss, Ed Zedmore, Winston's dad, is dead and set against this and just tries to rebury the stuff, but the dirt wouldn't hold. So, Charlie, a construction worker, decides to go against his boss's wishes and calls the Ghostbusters. While all this is happening, the Ghostbusters are losing stuff. Well, this may not sound like a big deal, but Peter's sneakers literally get up and walk away. In fact, everything is, seems to be disappearing. Like, the road even rolls up, literally. If there's one thing Peter and Winston have in common, it's that they have a strained relationship with their fathers. Ed is by no means a crook. He just doesn't take the Ghostbusters seriously. In fact, throughout this entire episode, he makes a lot of disparaging remarks about them. Ed is basically that father who wanted his son to follow in his footsteps and was greatly disappointed when he ultimately didn't. So that caused a strain in their relationship. The scene where Winston first encounters his father, they act like they hadn't even spoken to each other in a while. Well, Winston and his dad get kidnapped by the collector of lost objects, who has been stealing everything in their world to try to find the key. During their imprisonment, Winston and his dad start to bond. Really, this is why I put this episode at this spot, is because it's essentially about a father and son making up while being held captive by a ghost. <laughs> Only the Ghostbusters can do that. Only. Before moving on to number two, I'd like to point out that Winston's father was voiced by Roscoe Lee Brown, who some of you may know as the voice of the Kingpin in Spider-Man the Animated Series. Number 2 The Thing in Mrs. Fathersham's Attic For 70 years, Mrs. Fathersham 
has not been up in her own attic. Ever since her father forbid it when she was a little girl, she has not been up there. So, why does she believe it's haunted? It's because of the horrible noises she would hear from the attic late at night. She has no idea why her father forbid her from ever going up in the attic. She just knows that there is something bad up there. Well, finally she had enough of it and called the Ghostbusters. Mrs. Fathersham does not have a lot of money, but is willing to give the Ghostbusters every penny she has if it, they would just get rid of whatever it is up in her attic. Peter, on the other hand, agrees to do the job for nothing. This is pretty out of character for Peter since throughout the series, he is always the first to bring up the money. I mean, if they weren't getting paid for a job, he didn't want to do it. But in this episode, he does. And why is that? Because she reminds him of his mother, and this episode suggests that she had passed away some time ago. The Ghostbusters go up into Mrs. Fathersham's attic, where they encounter the Fang. The Fang is basically a creature filled with pure hatred for Fathersham. Note, I said Fathersham, not Mrs. Fathersham. In a way, this episode is a mystery. The mystery is, what is this Fane and why does he hate Fathersham so much? Unlike most cartoon villains, the Fane does not explain to the Ghostbusters why he hates Fathersham. They have to figure that out for themselves. Also, an interesting thing about the Fane is that he can control everything within that attic, whether it be an umbrella or a tea kettle. But a curious thing about him is that, despite his great power, he cannot leave the attic. In this episode, Mrs. Fathersham often talks fondly about her father. She loved him greatly. But the thing is like a dirty little secret that she has to live with. And that's one of the sad parts of this episode is that someone she cared about so much and who cared about her left this thing behind for her to deal with. And despite the darkness this episode has, it shows a soft side to Peter we normally don't get to see. We all see that he's a wise guy in the movies as well as the show, but here, you know, it shows that he can be a really decent guy. Without spoiling the ending, I will just say that if you do not have a tear in your eye, you have no soul. Number one. Flip side. There is only one reason why I place flip side at the number one spot. And that is the People Busters. The Ghostbusters investigate a mysterious tornado that touched down in the middle of Manhattan. Egon states that it's not a real tornado. What it is is a doorway to another world. And in this world, New York is called Boo York, the Big Pumpkin. It's basically a ghost version of New York. And like in New York, they have their own set of people who bust ghosts, or in this case, people, the People Busters. The People Busters make this episode. I mean, look how... Awesome they look, with Ray's hand for a foot, Peter's zombie-like appearance, and Egon's skeletal look. These guys are awesome, and like in the second movie, they use slime to bust the people instead of their proton packs. But what about People Buster Winston? Like the poster to the very first movie, Winston is sadly not one of the People Busters. I would say it's because he didn't go with them to New York, but there's a people buster Janine, and she did not go to New York either. 
Fortunately, if you want to see a people buster version of Winston, check out the IDW comics. It just goes to show you how powerful this episode is that that the comics had corrected the mistake from this episode. And that was my top 15 best episodes of the real Ghostbusters. Let me know in the comments section what you guys think and which episodes that I didn't include in this list that you guys like. Now if you excuse me, I'm gonna go drink some Ecto Cooler. See you later.